So we've just also started recording the session. Um, hello, everyone. It is a huge, huge pleasure um, to welcome you all to this event, um, our Climate Justice for All webinar series that we, the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy, together with the Ban Ki-moon Center, have been and will continue to co-host um, and we're covering all sorts of topics um, around climate justice. So um, looking at the climate crisis from a intersectional feminist perspective. I am Christina, I'm one of the co-founders of the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy. I'm leading the team with my co-founder Nina here in Berlin. Then there's Marissa, the third co-founder. She's leading the organization in London. We are a research advocacy and consulting organization that yeah, tries to smash patriarchy within foreign and security policy. And we're doing this by bringing feminist analysis, feminist intersectional analysis into all sorts of topics within foreign security policy from like tonight, climate justice to disarmament, the women, peace and security agenda. Um, also trying to bring decolonial perspectives into foreign security policy. Um, and the event tonight is a, it's a huge honor because we are having with us two incredible speakers. That is Mary Robinson and Dorothy Naluviga. I'll introduce both um, in a second. First, I would like to mention that this is the third event of our climate justice series that we've been hosting in collaboration with the Ban Ki-moon Center. You can find all our recordings on the Ban Ki-moon's YouTube channel. And so I want to mention that we're very grateful to our colleagues at the Ban Ki-moon Center. And I'd actually like to now um, show a video of um, the co-founder and co-chair Heinz Fischer of the Ban Ki-moon Center because he has a short video message for us. doesn't seem to be working quite right. One second, everyone. It's only been one and a half years into the pandemic and getting to um, getting used to Zoom. So it seems we might have some technical issues. Just give us a second. If not, let me know and I'll, um, Jessica, and I'll continue and we'll listen, potentially listen to the video message later on. Um, the flexible, it's easy, whatever works. Okay. Then I'll continue for now. We'll see if we'll get the video message um, by Heinz Fischer up and running. That would be lovely. We'll see. Um, but Then um, it's now my honor to introduce our incredible speakers um, for this evening, um, Berlin evening, um, to you now. So we have with us, as I mentioned before, Mary Robinson and Dorothy Naluvega. And um, I'll start with you, Mary. Um, Mary Robinson is adjunct professor for climate justice in Trinity College, Dublin, and chair of the Elders. 
Um, and as I guess everyone knows, she served as president of Ireland from 1990 to 1997 and UN High Commissioner for Human Rights from 1997 to 2002. She's a member of the Club of Madrid and the recipient of numerous honors and awards, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom from the President of the U United States, Barack Obama. Between 2013 and 2016, Mary Robinson served as the UN Secretary General's Special Envoy in three roles. First, for the Great Lakes region Africa, then on climate change leading up to the Paris Agreement, and in 2016 as his Special Envoy on El Nino and climate. Her foundation, the Mary Robinson Foundation, Climate Justice, established in 2010, came to a planned end in April 2019. Mary Robinson's memoir, Everybody Matters, was published in September 2012, and her book, Climate Justice, Hope, Resilience, and the Fight for a Sustainable Future, was published in September 2018. She's also co-host of a podcast on the climate crisis called Mothers of Invention. A huge honor. Thank you for being here, Mary. Um, and with Mary on the panel, we'll also have Dorothy Nalubega. And Dorothy is a human rights activist specializing in environmental rights, women's and children's rights, and vulnerable groups' rights. As an environmentalist and a climate change campaigner, she's been a panelist and speaker on several climate change um, events, including the COPs and others. Dorothy has organized several environmental events like Wakiso District Climate Change Walk and has led campaigns, including the Kick Plastics Out of Lake Victoria. She led the Global Greens delegation at COP24 in Katowice in 2018. On top, at CFP, we had the honor to speak to her and learn from her before because she gave an interview to us at the end of 2019 already. Um, I would like to now hand over to you, Mary, for your key keynote remarks. And we're so grateful to have both of you here. Thank you very much. And I'm very happy to appear on this panel with Dorothy and to uh, speak about the subject of the climate crisis and gender. It's something that I'm very passionate about. But the first thing I feel I should do is admit that I came late to understanding the impacts of climate change um, in poorer parts of the world. When I was president of Ireland from 1990 to 1997, I didn't make any speech about climate. I spoke about the environment, but climate wasn't impacting Ireland in that sense. And then when I became UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, there was another part of the UN dealing with climate. And I was in a kind of large silo, uh, you know, human rights, gender, rights of people with disabilities, rights of indigenous peoples, but I didn't make the connection. It was after that when I formed a very small NGO called Realizing Rights to work with others in African countries on the rights that really matter if you don't have them, rights to food, water, health, education, shelter. And everywhere I went, you know, from about 2003 on, I kept hearing things are so much worse now. And it was about the unpredictability of the weather, frankly. It was about the fact that the rainy seasons weren't coming the way they used to, that there were long periods of drought and flash flooding that destroyed a school or a village. And this is what I wrote about in my book on climate justice, the, uh, the, the very severe impacts on the poorest countries. And because I came to the climate change issue through a human rights lens, I only talk really about climate justice or the climate crisis. I don't really talk about climate change as such. But I was very shocked when I attended my first climate conference in Copenhagen in 2009, because there was nothing really about gender or human rights. It was very technical, it was very scientific, and frankly, it was very male. And uh, so I got quite angry about that. And the following year, with a number of other women leaders, in Cancun, the next COP in Mexico, we formed the uh, uh, Women Leaders on Gender and Climate Network. And those women leaders were ministers of environment, ministers of energy, ministers of foreign affairs in some cases from around the world who attended COPs, and also the heads of UN agencies 
um, from Zilli and UN Women. Helen Clark was head of the UNDP for a while. Amina Mohammed joined us both as initially as Minister of Environment of Nigeria and then subsequently um, in her role as Deputy Secretary General. And we were able to influence policy from then on towards the Paris Agreement. We were able to help a wide constituency of women who had been struggling to try to get gender on the agenda and get a gender action plan. We were able to help with that. And then the other thing that we did was we recognized the importance of having the right voices at the table. And by the right voices, I mean people like Dorothy and other, you know, um, those who are working on the ground in a frontline way on issues of climate, indigenous, young people, grassroots, uh, to get those voices. And because these women in the network were heads of delegations, they were able to determine who would get the badge to be in the room with the delegates, not out in the civil society space where you'd get great vibrancy, but the delegates wouldn't go there, and wouldn't listen. So these people had to get to the table itself. And I remember how impactful that was um, to listen to real experts because they were um, making their communities resilient despite the shocks of climate change and having somebody like Hindu Amaro Ibrahim from Chad, um, who uh, was a leader um, of the Indigenous Forum, speaking directly and other uh, very good experts, as I say, made a big difference in preparing for Paris and at Paris and subsequent to Paris. I want to say a few words about um, the podcast that was referenced, because that was when I explicitly talked about uh, gender in a feminist way. I mean, the byline for the podcast, as some of you will know, is that climate change is a man-made problem and requires a feminist solution. Um, I always explain that man-made is generic. It includes all of us, even though men had more power and probably did contribute more to the problem. Um, and a feminist solution definitely includes as many men as possible. But what I found very valuable myself in the uh, podcast was we use humor um, to address the situation. We mainly tried to uh, speak to and listen to women from the South, both of the United States and around the world on, on the issues that they were dealing with. Um, it was co-hosted initially by um, two of us as Irish women, and myself and a, very, a much younger um, Maeve Higgins, who was eight years old when I was elected president. She's a successful comedian and writer in New York. And half the humor was she was only half respectful of me and very funny. So uh, we, we were very serious about addressing the climate issue, but we did it with humor. But we did it absolutely from a feminist lens, looking at you know, issues of patriarchy, issues of colonialism, issues of, um, you know, all, all of the kind of issues, the tough issues, racism, et cetera, through that lens. And I learned a lot from listening uh, to those who participated. Uh, so I'm very happy to take part. I, I only want to speak briefly at this stage. I want to hear Dorothy, and then I know you want to ask us some questions and, and have a, a Q&A session. But I am absolutely convinced that women's leadership is, is key now um, in addressing the urgency of the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis. Um, if I can put it that way, in, in this way, in the last couple of years, I've become part of connected women, dangerous women, fearless women. Um, um, I, I'm co-host, co-chair with Ellen Johnson Sirleaf of a women leaders network for the Africa Europe Climate Foundation. And why so many, um, uh, networks of women leaders, and I'll end with this point, because frankly, there's a huge trust among women leaders. I find that with a lot of my African women friends, but I also find it when we have this Africa Europe, I find it with American uh, uh, friends, I find it with business women when we're together, there's a kind of openness to each other and trust that means that we can talk about issues in a very honest, very deep way and make progress. And so that's really important. And um, there isn't enough trust around, as we know, the very fractured multilateral system. So this is a, a key, almost a treasure that we should value enough that we, in speaking together as women leaders, connect and can actually uh, make progress together. So I'll 
finish there for the moment and uh, look forward to listening to Dorothy. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, I love how you not only mentioned kind of the, the feminist dimension and the justice dimension, obviously, which to you comes so natural because of your background of the issue, but also like the, the idea of feminist and solidarity between women. So women's solidarity as a feminist concept as well to tackle the climate crisis. So thank you so much. And before I'll hand over to Sheena, my colleague, who will then um, be the moderator for the panel discussion, we'll try actually again to bring in um, Heinz Fischer and his video message. So please bear with us as we're trying this again. So we're trying to play our magic. Um, let's see what's happening. And again, can't hear the sound. That is such a pity. It wasn't like that when we practiced, obviously. Hmm. Jessica, do you want to try one more thing? Then. So someone says, there's a little box you need to take for sound when you click share screen. I love this teamwork here. So where's the little box? Mm -hmm. Focusing on Philip ah. Robinson, dear friend, dear Mrs. Malubega, ladies and gentlemen. As co-chair of the Ban Ki-moon Center, it is my pleasure to address all of you today at the third climate justice webinar focusing on feminist foreign policy. As former heads of state, Mary Robinson and I were both deeply involved in monitoring national as well as foreign policies. Negotiations, treaties and rule of law were on our daily agenda. I have always understood foreign policy and multilateralism as a chance for cooperation and supporting common values going far beyond economic interests and security. After the horrors of the Second World War, politicians and civil society were and still are determined to work together hand in hand towards a future of peace, solidarity, and human dignity. The United Nations and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights were born, international agreements were signed, and global partnerships were established. I strongly believe that foreign policy is closely linked to women's, children's, migrants, black and indigenous disabled people's LGBT and workers' rights. That foreign policy should not only protect, but empower and value marginalized people. And that a successful foreign policy can tackle the global threats of climate change, pandemics, and nuclear proliferation. A feminist foreign policy encompasses all these crucial components and puts people at the heart of security and international politics. Climate change is probably the biggest challenge humanity is currently facing, and we need to act now. Former Secretary General of the United Nations and co-chair of the Ban Ki-moon Center, Ban Ki-moon, therefore successfully negotiated and implemented the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement that has since been signed by 194 states. The annual conference of the parties organized by the UNFCCC Secretariat and taking place since 1995 must ensure diverse and fair representation at the negotiation tables. Only by including the communities that are hit hardest by climate change 
we can truly limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. This is the reason why we are discussing today the intersections of feminist foreign policy and climate justice. I want to wish everyone a fruitful discussion on this important topic and encourage you to keep working towards leaving no one behind. Thank you for your attention and lots of success. Thank you to co-chair Heinz Fischer and to the Ban Ki-moon Center for this video message. And love goes out to Kate for helping us with this um, video message. And now it's my pleasure to hand over to my wonderful colleague, Sheena, who will now be the moderator of this conversation between herself, Mary and Dorothy. Sheena, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Christina. Also welcome everyone from my side, especially of course, uh, Mary Robinson and Dorothy Nalabega. And um, thanks for bearing with us. And now um, we did eventually get to see and hear Heinz Fischer after facing some technical issues, but um, I'm glad it worked out in the end. Uh, and since we've heard from uh, Mary Robinson first now, I would like to um, pose the first question to you, Dorothy. Um, as we've heard already uh, by, by Mary's keynote, um, but I, as I said, would like to hear your stance on this. Could you also share from your perspective on why the climate crisis and gender are inseparable and how um, possibly a feminist foreign policy can be a tool to achieve climate justice? Um, thank you very much, Shina. Uh, I'm so happy uh, to be invited by Center for Feminist um, Foreign Policy. And I'm so happy to see all these participants online. Uh, especially I welcome my colleagues from Uganda and Kenya. Uh, I would like to, to, to inform the panel, my, my panelists that I have about two bosses watching me. I have one a director from Pan Africa Choir. I have um, Miriam Kennett from Green Economics Institute, Oxford, and my fellow Greens from East Africa, Kenya and Uganda. I have seen you already and I'm so happy. Uh, I'm also glad to be on the panel with the former president of Ireland, Ms. Her, um, Mary Robinson, and I'll go straight to the answer, Shina. Uh, you said how climate crisis and gender are inseparable. This is so interesting. It is rightfully said, because how could you separate the two, yet almost every effect of climate crisis befalls on women and other vulnerable groups? Uh, in my country, for example, women are the most affected because the biggest percentage of, of, of people employed in agriculture is women, yet climate crisis has had a very big impact on agriculture. Prolonged droughts and uh, floods have destroyed the productivity, meaning the yields cannot sustain women who sell crops to the markets. And apart from that, um, given the gender uh, perspective in my country, it is women who go to farms to look for food. So when productivity is low, then that means there is no food. And that will uh, cause women to be stressed because they will be wondering where to get food. The women and girls in my country are the ones who go uh, to fetch water from um, far, especially when the droughts have dried up the uh, water sources around them. And what happens is sometimes they get raped, especially the girls, because they go to those uh, wells to fetch water in the dark. So, I mean, you cannot separate uh, climate crisis and gender. We've heard of girls who have been impregnated uh, or gang raped because they're fetching water from very far. 
when I talk about this, the people from Kampala or Nairobi may not realize this, but people from the villages, from the countryside know this. So climate crisis and gender are not inseparable. And yes, feminist foreign policy can be a tool to achieve justice because if I take a case of um, Swedish feminist foreign policy that looks at the three areas, rights, representation, and resources, I see hope. If women's rights are promoted and protected, if there is gender equality, climate justice can be achieved. If um, those people who are marginalized, the groups who are marginalized, if they are represented at all levels of decision making, there will be climate justice. And if all resources are equally distributed, there will be climate justice, simple. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dorothy, for, for your answer and also uh, the, the many um, examples that, that you already gave. Um, I'd like to, to go on with a, with a question uh, directed to, to Mary. So um, uh, to many people, especially outside uh, the sphere of foreign and security policy, uh, feminist foreign policy, and we've already talked about this a little, um, often appears uh, a rather as a rather abstract concept um, and tool. And uh, now you wrote an entire book uh, filled with feminist uh, solutions to tackle this um, man, or as we also said before, human-made uh, problem. How uh, would you say can we translate the everyday struggles of feminists and environmentalists to the international uh, level and vice versa? Uh, what does it actually need to, to truly come together and, uh, and get everyone uh, at one table, especially keeping um, power imbalances in, in mind? Well, to me, you know, a feminist foreign policy is very much a policy based on climate justice insofar as climate is the issue. And that's what we're mainly focusing on in, in, in this uh, webinar. And I think it's probably good to look more deeply at the layers of injustice that require a climate justice approach, because there are at least five layers. And the first layer is that uh, the climate impacts much earlier and much more severely the poorest countries, the poorest communities, small island states and indigenous communities. And they are the least responsible but they are also the black and brown people in our world. So it's a racial injustice. Secondly, there is the feminist injustice. They, sorry, the gender injustice. And uh, we've talked a little about this, but it, it, it's really about the different social roles all over the world, the inequality of pay, the care responsibilities. Um, you know, there, there, there are so many different issues and uh, in, in some cases, women may lack land rights, lack access to credit, lack training, all of that, and yet have to try and make their communities resilient. So that's a very big uh, uh, injustice. Thirdly, the intergenerational injustice. And fortunately, the young climate activists um, have been reminding us of that. And what I love about the way they do it is they call us out as not being on course for a safe world because we're not listening to the science. And that's a really um, effective way of campaigning. You must listen to the science and uh, follow the science. Otherwise we will not have a safe future. And they're right um, to be as, um, uh, they're right to accuse us in the way that they do. Third, uh, fourthly, there is the injustice of the pathways to development. And I think this one, hopefully would be of particular interest to Dorothy um, in countries like Uganda, because the pathway to development of the industrialized world was fossil fuel. We built our economies on fossil fuel. So our responsibility now is to wean ourselves off and do it with just transition, meaning do it with a real attention to 
the workers and their communities. Luckily now this is recognized. The European Union in its green policy has a, a, um, a just transition fund and most countries um, in the industrialized world realize that we have to resource those communities to be part of the solution, to get their share of the green jobs that are going, et cetera, and, 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 and the green economy. But developing countries also want to go green as much as possible, but they need the investment, they need the training, they need the skills, they may need the intellectual property, and we have not shown that solidarity from the industrialized world. And we're trying to prevent um, any use of fossil fuel because it will use up the carbon budget, et cetera. So it, it, that's another injustice, um, very complicated, but very real. And the fifth injustice is the injustice to nature herself, the injustice um, of the loss of biodiversity and the extinction of species. And um, in many ways, if I'm not going on too long, can I just very briefly say how, how much we can learn from this COVID time? It has taken us all out of our comfort zone. And it has been a mirror that has exacerbated all of those inequalities that I mentioned and brought out the intersectionality between them, which is a great feminist term. And I'm very keen that we emphasize it. Um, and therefore, you know, I think there is more likelihood that particularly those young climate activists will also become activists for Black Lives Matter, for the Me Too campaign, for all of the other campaigns on inequalities, that we broaden that world of the injustices so that we all um, build a more powerful uh, counter um, to the inequalities in our world. And then very quickly for um, uh, other positive lessons we can learn from COVID. First of all, collective human behavior matters. It's the only thing protecting us from the virus. The, uh, the way that we're social distancing, washing our hands a lot, all of that. Um, we need collective behavior, particularly in the industrialized world, to waste less, produce less, consume less, um, change our eating habits, etc. cetera. Um, um, secondly, government matters. We can see governments that have um, uh, you know, um, done badly, not listen to the science, and the lives and health of their population and their economies have suffered terribly. So government matters. Thirdly, science matters, what the young people have been telling us. And fourthly, subtly, compassion matters. Um, you know, um, we are more open now to the suffering of the other. It's happening in countries. It's not happening enough across borders because we're not seeing um, an equitable access to vaccines, for example. We're not seeing... Now, I mention all of these things because for me, all of these things are a feminist foreign policy. It starts with the real problems from the bottom up and then translates them into how to move forward from a policy point of view and a multicultural and multilateral point of view. Thank you so much for, for this answer and also already highlighting um, the huge uh, intersections that we see uh, within, within this topic. And also, um, and I totally uh, agree here with you and everyone, I think, at CFFP of how all of these topics are connected and we will not win, so to speak, if we only tackle one issue at a time, but we really need to see how they are deeply connected. Um, in, in, in what kind of phenomena they are rooted and how, how to work together to, to, to tackle them. I'm uh, also glad you already mentioned um, how, how racial justice and also other injustices are, are a part of, um, of this topic. And um, as many of you might know, um, today, uh, May 25th, uh, also marks the first anniversary of the murder of George Floyd in uh, Minneapolis. And right after the devastating video spread, um, we saw huge uh, uh, protests all over the world, actually, and we could witness collaborations between activists uh, that before maybe only fought for racial justice or only for climate justice and uh, yeah, coming together. But we could also see climate groups uh, were kind of hesitant to show uh, su support for anti-racist struggles. And um, Mary, since you already kind of answered that question, I would I would add a question here of, um, does any of you, um, both you and Dorothy maybe have 
advice to to especially young activists how can they come together and work together and truly truly take up this intersectional uh, fight um, especially if they focused on one topic um, before and I think uh, Dorothy you already have some experiences uh, with that in in Uganda since you've uh, also worked together with uh, Fridays for Future in Uganda and and other groups so um either one of you uh, wants to have a go at this question. Dorothy, you go ahead. Thank you. Um, Ms. Mary Robinson has already um, talked about that, yes, I believe. But because human rights are universal and inherent, uh, and because most of the activists normally are fighting for rights of groups. And because uh, all these, for example, uh, um, environmental rights, they're also group rights according to the 1948 Declaration of, of, Universal, uh, of Universal Rights. That means we cannot leave any, we cannot leave each other. We have to fight together we need to be together in this in order for us to win. Lina has already mentioned that. So if you see your uh, other active fighting for another right, you are also supposed to join in. You have to walk the talk. Um, we had, uh, I actually thank you for bringing about this topic of George Floyd, because we had uh, a similar, we had a similar scenario, don't get scared. No one was shot. Uh, it was about this fellow uh, activist. She's called Vanessa Nakate of Fridays for Future. She went to Davos to attend a, a climate change conference. And they were together with other activists from the global north. And uh, they had a, a press conference. When they had a press conference, AP or Associated Press, you know that, uh, they published. But when they published, they cropped out her photo and they remained only with the photos of other white um, activists. Um, this was so, 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 so bad. If we are really fighting for the same cause, why would you crop out a photo of uh, a black activist? I mean, if this black activist, activist is representing voices of blacks or Africans, you erasing out her photo and not even reporting anything she has said in the press conference would mean erasing uh, voices of Africans who even emit less but are most vulnerable to the effects of climate change. So my advice or my suggestion, or I urge all activists from Uganda, Kenya, East Africa, and those from, from Global North to work together with us in the Global South to, uh, to solve the same problem because what affects us here affects the whole world. You all know that um, climate crisis is a global issue. So it's not about you here because for you, You've, you know that, and that's why you invited me to come and voice out the, what happens in Africa and Uganda. Mm -hmm. So I thank you very much for that, but we should also advise other people to do the same. Thank you very much. And can I just um, build on what Dorothy was saying um, and, and, and just give a simple reference to something that really pleased me. Um, I'm a great believer in the intergenerational dialogue uh, because it has changed. Um, when I was growing up, you know, I'm an elder. When I was growing up, it was a one way, um, very deferential, the younger person listening to the wisdom of the elder. Um, thankfully that has completely changed. And now young people are so smart, they're digitally connected, they're doing things, et cetera. So it's a, a real dialogue and the elders um, that I'm the chair of, um, we have promoted a lot of this intergenerational dialogue and we've encouraged young climate scientists to provide blogs. And it just so happens that today 
we've launched another blog, which I'm, I happen to be promoting, of a young climate activist called Nikaylia, N-I-K-A-Y-L-A Jefferson from California. And she writes of her experience as a black queer young woman in the, in the youth climate movement. And she got terribly depressed and she, you know, she writes beautifully. And then she had to pick herself up and put the pieces back together. And it's a kind of message of hope. It's, it's really powerful. So I would encourage you to go into the uh, elders website. It's the elders.org and, and read her blog. It, you know, it's just one of those moments where a young person captures the true intersectionality and does it beautifully and, and graces it with, you know, poetic language that, uh, that's really moving. Thank you both, and thank you uh, so much for for uh, this example. Um, I think there was already a question in the chat. If you could repeat the name um, of of the yeah. activist that you just yeah. mentioned. Yeah, she's um, uh, Nikalia. I'm not familiar with the name, so I don't pronounce it very well. N i k a y l a, and then Jefferson, J e f f J e f f e r s o n, and. Her blog is um, is on the website now of the elders. We we we, we just you know we we've done a number of these blogs and hers is on today by just by that lovely coincidence and because she she just captures uh, you know she captures in a way that is very true uh, the pain of the intersectionality and yet her hope as well as she puts her pieces together again as she said that we all have to do this we all have to become more resilient and so on. I mean, it's just beautifully done. I was, I was really very moved by it and very proud to kind of promote it. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing it and um, can't wait to, to uh, read some, some of her poems. And- um, No, it's not a poem, it's a blog. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, but her language is poetic, but it's a blog. <laughs> And um, yeah, to everyone, if you didn't get the name, um, as uh, Mary Robinson said, it's also to be found on the uh, website of the elders. And um, I'd like to go on uh, with a question and uh, to both of you actually, but Dorothy, you mentioned this uh, when, when you gave the example of how uh, women in Uganda are um, uh, disproportionately working in, in the agricultural sector and uh, thus also um, face uh, higher risks of um, gender-based violence. And uh, what we sometimes uh, struggle to do is to really explain to, to people who are not that familiar with the topic how the climate crisis really is a security issue, especially for, for women and girls. And um, my, my question here would be if you could share a concrete, um, another concrete example maybe um, of how uh, uh, the climate crisis is a security issue and what has to be done, especially on the international level to, to acknowledge it um, as such. But if you have another example, of course, also at the, the national or local level. Yeah, thank you, Shina. Yeah, like you said, I've already mentioned one example, but I, I'll give you another one. Uh, other women, uh, during our research, confess that domestic violence in their home is sometimes caused by climate crisis because when the yields are not enough, the little that is got, the women think they should keep the, they should keep it for to feed their families instead of selling it off. But the men are so greedy and uh, so money minded; they want to sell everything and get money. Of course, the women being the, uh, the ones who offer the highest percentage of labor on farms want to fight back. And when that happens, uh, of course, the men end up beating them up so badly. And isn't that insecurity? And one of the things we should do is this very one you're already doing. These kinds of webinars you've already included, my, my voice uh, and those of the people that I represent to the international level. If this is published at all, then the international level will recognize that climate crisis is a security issue already 
experienced in Africa and elsewhere, actually they should also recognize the fact that it is one of the reasons for migrants. If I had time, I'll go, um, I'll go far in that, but uh, I, I won't be able now. Uh, and also because according to Center for Feminist Foreign Policy, the police acknowledges that climate crisis is a security issue. I'm sure that it would tackle this by solving climate crisis direct or indirect causes to ensure safety, security and justice for everyone through creating awareness, empowering women, facilitating um, gender equality and elevating the voices of those who have suffered the, these calamities. I am sure they will also use the law to make climate change uh, per perpetrators answerable. Uh, for the biggest emitters should be punished and they should pay for the damages they've caused. Thank you. Can I just um, make a comment um, on, 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 in, in addition to what um, uh, uh, was being said, because you know, you're the center for um, uh, feminist foreign policy. The main policy arena for the really tough uh, security issues is the um, uh, Security Council. And yet the Security Council is not really willing to talk about climate. It's, uh, there is now a kind of informal um, uh, sort of group on climate and, and security um, of members. Um, Ireland um, became again um, a non-permanent member of the Security Council in January. I, I helped a lot because I was very keen that Ireland would become a member again because Ireland, um, when it's a member, does the right thing. It, it is disinterested, it fights for the right causes and it's trying to get more attention to climate as a security issue, but it's really difficult. Um, the, 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 you know, the, the members of the Security Council don't really want to, um, and you know, th that's shocking given the huge security implications and some of the issues that, that um, uh, were, were, were being talked about. I mean, it's, it's really, you know, Dorothy has you know, shown how important it is as a security issue. Yeah, thank you for for mentioning uh, the the Security Council in this. And as you said, it's uh, shocking, and I personally often find it so frustrating, especially if we look at all all of the important work that activists, environmentalists, and other people do. Um, all year round and then hoping that it finally will be mentioned or um, increasingly addressed at the international level. And then, yeah, um, the, just feeling the frustration if, if that doesn't, doesn't happen. Um, but uh, speaking uh, about uh, such, like, yeah, about um, the international level and the Security Council, but also, of course, um, uh, on other other um, levels, what kind of concrete policies and measures would you uh, wish to come in place to jointly fight the climate cri uh, crisis on an international um, level? Do you have uh, concrete policies that you would like to, to suggest and wish to be implemented uh, tomorrow? I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we actually know what is needed. Uh, we know that there are two big frameworks this year. One is less talked about, the COP15 in Kunming in China on uh, biological diversity. Uh, we need a commitment of all countries to protect 30% of the land, 30% of the oceans globally. Um, I'm glad to say there is a, a proposal for it. There's a gender action plan at last in that COP. Um, and uh, the one that we're more familiar with and is of huge urgency is COP26 in Glasgow. Uh, we have to have every country commit to nationally determined contributions that don't talk about where they'll be in 2050 so much. I mean, there are a lot of countries that have committed and a lot of corporations and a lot of cities have committed to be net zero uh, by uh, 2050, uh, but they haven't worked out how they're going to get there. What this COP is all about is um, you know, holding the feet to the fire on not only where will you be in 2030, but where will you be in 2025 and 2023 and 2022 to get 
to where we need to be. We know from the uh, report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in October of 2018, which was about keeping global warming at 1.5 degrees, that it is a huge challenge. There's no, no getting away from it. We have to reduce by 45% our carbon emissions by 2030. And that's less than 10 years away. And we're not seeing um, that on track at the moment, but it is beginning. There's a shift. Um, I'll tell you why I'm, I'm a little bit more hopeful. First of all, the G7 of environment ministers and John Kerry was also there committed the other day for the first time to align um, the G7 with the um, need to have a 1.5 degree goal. Uh, that's the first time that's happened. Secondly, um, uh, investors are more and more um, you know, coming together and Mark Carney and um, Hiro from Japan, who's another envoy, um, they, they've been working very closely and Mike Bloomfield on, on cities, they've been working um, to get um, investors to switch um, their investment. That's important. But also um, the International Energy Agency, um, they've issued a report uh, recently, um, just in the last few days, which for the first time again, aligns fully with 1.5 degrees. Um, Fatih Birol, the executive director of the International Energy Agency is on the right side of this issue, but it has been in the past quite a conservative body, quite a fossil fuel supported body, and it has been hard to make the switch. And now finally, um, they've issued a report and he speaks about the huge transformative change that has to take place um, for that to, to come about. So, you know, um, we, we don't need to reinvent any wheels. We just need to get terribly serious about the transformative change that is needed um, in having our um, nationally determined contributions, having the climate finance that's probably the most worrying, that we don't see enough climate finance on the table. The Earth Summit that President Biden convened um, on Earth Day, the 22nd of April, uh, made progress. But yeah, when the United States said it was going to double its climate finance, that sounded good, but it's not. They're not actually um, anything like as significant uh, supporters of climate finance as they need to be. They need to double, at least double again. Um, to be uh, to be where France and Germany and the UK um, and the European Union are, and and they need to also increase further. So, uh, and 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 obviously we need to stop coal. And, and what China does is absolutely um, uh, crucial. So, uh, sorry, I, I went on a bit, but it's not a case of reinventing wheels. There's nothing new. It's implementation, implementation, transformation realizing uh, you know, what a big stretch it is. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Dorothy, is there anything you wanna add to that? Yep, <laughs> okay. Um, with uh, an eye on the time, I uh, would save my other questions for, for later. So we would still have time for the Q&A from the audience. I would just maybe um, ask you one uh, final question for, for this uh, panel discussion between the three of us. Um, and if you allow me, it would be a more personal question. Uh, simply, how do you do it all? Like uh, combining activism and political work, everyday struggles and setbacks, um, while uh, tackling huge and pressing issues like uh, the climate crisis. And now since last year, the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, can you maybe share some strategies on how to stay focused uh, while also taking care of your own well-being, which I'm sure uh, Many, many of us uh, among us today um, experienced uh, themselves. I know I have. So um, yeah, it would be would be grateful if you could share share your thoughts on that. Dorothy, you go first. Thank you, Ms. Robinson, for giving me a chance to go first. Uh, I would say passion. When you love something and let people know that you love it, then you can manage. Secondly, is to involve other people. I, I still work under a boss. I'm not my own boss. But in the beginning, it was very difficult for me to deal with work 
and um, activism. So what I did when I organized the climate change walk in, in Wakiso district where I work, I involved my boss. I invited him to be the chief worker. He got uh, a lot of coverage for he's a politician and he was so happy. From then I started involving him whenever we have an activity and he has time. For example, um, uh, the cleaning up of Lake Victoria, I invite him, he comes and he cleans up and he gets a lot of coverage, him being a big politician. So these days, whenever I ask him for time off, <laughs> that I'm going to do this activism, he just agrees to it. And uh, <laughs> uh, like uh, I said, uh, involving people, well, you mentioned all those ones, but I don't know whether you, were, you, you thought you'd be so personal if you mentioned family as well, but family is another big issue here, balancing family and activism. But how do I do it myself? I involve them. If, I'm, if I say we have an activity tomorrow, if we are going to, uh, to plant trees somewhere uh, at a school, if we are going to clean up the plastics from lake shores, I go with my children, with my stepchildren, with my um, nieces and nephews and friends. So if we come back late, who will ask whether mother has not given us Time because we've been together and you've been seeing what is going on. So if, uh, if you involve everyone, then you can manage. And um, for person uh, for for personal struggles like the global pandemic, I just remain uh, uh, strong and focused. I try to I I try not to lose hope. I think and pray a lot. So that keeps me going. Thank you. Well, Dorothy, um, I, I find myself in a lot of agreement, particularly on your first major points. I too share the passion and it does keep you going. And I do uh, try to involve other people. In fact, I need other people to help me to clarify my thinking to the, you know, the, I haven't managed to get the family members roped in the way you're talking about quite so much, I must say. Um, but actually, I think the question is important because in our last series for Mothers of Invention, when we were having this kind of wonderful discussion with women, and we have just a few um, good men, I think we have five men that we've um, had in the, in the three series, the three session, but uh, in the last one, we, we, we asked each of the contributors what they were doing for self-care, especially because of COVID. You know, what are you doing you know, to make sure that you yourself are coping. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually glad that you, you, you had this question because I, I think it's a really important one. And, um, uh, you know, uh, when Nelson Mandela brought the elders together, he required us to bring hope, you know, that, that uh, we, we must bring hope where there is despair and we must bring peace in conflicts, we must bring hope. And um, I had a wonderful opportunity to uh, hear Archbishop Tutu um, when he was chair of the elders a few years ago, we were on a panel together um, in, in New York in front of young people on their social media, their iPads and their um, phones, etc. cetera. Um, it was a social good conference. And we were being moderated by a journalist who said to Archbishop Tutu, why are you such an optimist? And she said it in quite a cross voice. And he smiled and said, oh no, I'm not an optimist. I'm a prisoner of hope. And I remember that expression. It really said a lot to me, you know, to be a prisoner of hope is to make sure no matter how difficult things are, there's something you can work with. Um, it's the opposite of talking about the climate issue in a doom filled way where all the oxygen, all the energy goes out of the room and people say, well, you know, this is too much for me. I can't cope. I'm, I'm just going to go on with my life and not pay attention. We want people to pay attention. We want people to have the hope and to take action and to do things. So we have to be prisoners of hope. And of course, the last thing that absolutely motivates me is that I'm lucky enough, I was lucky enough as an Irish mother to have three children with my husband and we're still together after 50 years. And now we have seven grandchildren and I can't tell you how excited I am about that, but I'm also concerned about you know, what their life will be like, which is why the intergenerational 
um, generate um, issue is, is is so important for me. They range in age from 17 to eight months. So, you know, I'm in that world with those 17 year olds and eight months olds, and, <laughs> and we've just got to get this right. <laughs> Thank you both so much for, for sharing your uh, personal experiences here. And um, I've noted that down, being a prisoner of hope, I like that. And also what you said, Dorothy Nalbeek, um, involving family members as well and like making it a family activity and, and uh, trying to combine uh, um, uh, your everyday and private life with, with your activism. Thank you both so much. And I would now open the floor for questions from the audience. Please uh, post your questions in the Q&A section. Um, or if you have trouble finding it or it doesn't show up uh, on your screen, you can also uh, post them in, in uh, the chat. And I think we already have some questions. Uh, so I would just uh, read them out to you and if some of them are addressed to either one of you, and if not, um, I just invite both of you, either one can have a go. And the first one would be, how can we ensure that climate diplomacy best advocates for the intersectionality of climate and feminism by Renee? Dorothy, you go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. How can we uh, ensure that climate diplomacy best advocates for the intersectionality of climate and feminism is one by creating awareness. Uh, like, um, uh, for example, uh, right, we can we, we can start by writing articles about this. If we we write articles and publish them either in our magazines or, or social media and people get not to, to, to know them, then the people concerned, the people who make decisions, for example, at UNF, UNFCC, will know about that and they will see how to, uh, to deal with it. But all we must do is make noise about it for people to know. Because here we think that everyone knows what is taking place. Uh, uh, Ms. Robinson already told us in her introduction that before she didn't know what was really happening to the poor vulnerable people in regards to climate crisis. But when she went to the ground, she saw what was happening, but not everyone knows. There are some people who don't know what is taking place. I think that's very true, Dorothy. I think, um, you know, uh, that's why we need the voices of those who are affected and who see it as an existential threat, because they live it as an existential threat. And that's why, as I said before Paris, it was the voices of the small island states, of the indigenous peoples, of the poorest countries, um, and civil society, marching in the street in Paris, 1.5 um, to stay alive, that got the 1.5 in. We need this urgency. And the problem, um, the problem is that we haven't got equitable access to vaccines. Um, so, um, you know, we're seeing what's happening in India now, but I'm told that Africa could also suffer a really bad, you know, surge uh, without adequate vaccines. And then how are people going to be present if they can't travel, if they, you know, if they're affected, if their health system is um, swamped, with, with, with COVID patients, et cetera, just at the time of these big um, uh, conferences. So this is a really uh, significant issue. The equitable access to vaccines is absolutely vital. Thank you both. Um, and we have also a question in the chat. Um, that refers to what we already talked about with the uh, Security Council. And the question is, would the uh, United Nations Security Council rather than the UNFCCC be an appropriate body for recognizing climate change as a security issue and adopting solutions to the nexus between the climate crisis, gender, peace, and security, perhaps under the WPS umbrella? <laughs> Tough one. All I can say about that is, uh, do you want to go ahead, Dorothy? 
<laughs> no, you go ahead. <laughs> um, all I can say is I wish, I wish, <laughs> I, I would love to see the Security Council take its responsibility. It is the worst part of the UN at the moment, and I don't mind saying that. It is not fulfilling its responsibilities. The elders say that over and over again. It has not fulfilled them on Syria. It has not fulfilled them recently on the Israeli-Palestinian issue. It is not fulfilling them on recognizing the security issue that climate poses. Um, uh, it, 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 it has these resolutions on women, peace and security, but they are not um, nearly enough of a priority. So I wish, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Ms. Robinson. <laughs> if they can't even do what you've said, which um, concerns them directly, how can they do this that they don't even understand? Some people don't understand that climate crisis is a security issue. So I, I think we'd rather leave it to UN, UNFCC. Maybe they make a report and give it to UN, to UN Security Council, but we cannot <laughs> say would, they would rather do that if they cannot even do what is directly uh, concerns them. Thank you both. And uh, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, there's also one question directly uh, to you, Mary, and I would um, take this one first because I know you have to go a little early. So the question would be um, by uh, Jennifer. The United um, Arab Emirates has recently made a bid to host the COP28 in 2023. And at the same time, they released a so-called proof of life photos of Princess Latif. But surely this is linked to ease pressure from the UN and international community at a time when they are marking the bid. There's also the case of Princess uh, Shamsa, who, who has been abducted from the streets of Cambridge 20 years ago at gunpoint and has not um, seen has not been seen since. Would you comment on how uh, the uh, UIE request for COP28 could be viewed in light of this? Well, clearly there needs to be more real evidence of proof of life of both um, uh, Latifa, who has been photographed, as you said, but we don't know the context of the photographs, and and uh, Shimsa, Shamsa, who um, uh, you know is also of concern. I'm glad that the Office of High Commissioner is very much uh, looking for proof of life, and the uh, mandates of the UN are very much looking, and that's that's really where that rests. Thank you. And um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you know, uh, um, I, I, about the whether the UAE, I mean, I, I think, you know, um, uh, any country can put itself forward. That's uh, very much a political decision at the end of the day. I mean, the next COP um, after Glasgow will be in Africa, I'm glad to know. Um, I'm not sure, it, you know, these are very political decisions and it, it's quite in the future. So I, I can't really comment particularly on that. Sure, thank you. And um, another question by Helena. Um, next year, we should be halfway in the implementation of the uh, 2030 agenda. To inspire towards setting milestones, it is important no, sorry, to inspire um, to, towards setting milestones is important part of the 2022 Initiative Foundation's work. What do you think it would take to have governments setting yearly actionable targets? Do you want to go ahead, Dorothy? <laughs> um, well, as you can see, I wear my badge um, to remind about the sustainable development goals in the context of uh, the whole climate issue. And the truth is, the truth is, sadly, that we are being driven back from implementation because of COVID. And women in particular have lost out badly, women and girls. Girls out of school pushed into early child marriage. That, that is going the wrong way. Um, losing education going the wrong way. Um, losing jobs and the caring um, burden that women have much more than men. Everything is going, even the jobs that women have had. Um, we've had a, a contrast between recognizing as heroes the essential workers, the doctors, the nurses, but also the cleaners and hospitals, et cetera, you know, heroes. But then women also work in sectors that were devastated and they've lost more jobs and nobody 
you know, takes into account enough um, that uh, dimension. So when, as we come out of COVID, we need to absolutely renew the commitment and it would be good to have it more measurable and really vigorously implemented. Um, and I, you know, I honor the work of those who are pressing hard and these should not be, um, you know, sort of wishes. We wish we would get there. They have to be measured. If you don't measure something, it's not going to happen. Sorry, I was just checking, Dorothy, if you wanted to add anything. Um, but if not, I would go on to the next question, uh, which is how can we ensure that inequalities in the international politics arena, for example, between Global North and Global South, are not reproduced in efforts of countering the climate crisis? The question is related to demands of the Global North uh, to Global South to do sustainable economy within a capitalist world order of which Global North nations have built their wealth on and which influence the way of how nations and people can achieve wealth? That's an easy question. Do you want to take that, Dorothy? You're still muted, Dorothy, in case you're saying something. Ah, how can we ensure that inequalities in the international politics arena between Global North and Global South are not reproduced? in efforts of countering the climate crisis. I mean, we, we should just go on and uh, tell people that uh, this is a global issue, that everyone is concerned, that we need to work together. I read said when we work together, we can solve problems. Uh, if they tell us to do, uh, to do, um, these uh, economies to change. Like um, Ms. Robinson talked about a just, a just transition. If you're telling us to stop using, um, to stop using uh, policing papers or policing bags, then you should help us somehow to see that there is an alternative. Uh, the Global South would like to change but sometimes they can't afford the, the alternatives, like the uh, alternative energy, because they also need money. They need a lot of money to change that. And if we are changing from, uh, say, uh, these uh, petrol that use, the cars that use fossil fuels to electric buses, then there should be some sort of uh, help I would, I would say, I, would, I wouldn't be ashamed to say that from the global north, because we don't emit that much, but we suffer the consequences. When coal is, uh, is got from Western Germany, it affects us here. So we need to work hand in hand. Uh, we, would like, uh, we would like to use collective transport in Uganda, but how can we use collective uh, transport when we don't even have railways for, for, for trains. So you find yourself using a car when you didn't even want. You would like to go to Kenya, which is very, very near by the way, Kenya, Rwanda, Tanzania, and Burundi are very near, but you don't want to use a, a plane. But how can you go there without a plane when they need you the next day on the job mm -hmm. and there is not a rail going from Uganda to Kenya? or from Uganda to Rwanda. When you use a bus, for example, from Uganda to Kenya, you spend 12, 12 hours. And in the plane, you, you spend only uh, 40, 55, 45 to 55 minutes. So we need to help each other. And again, you know, reflecting what, what Dorothy is saying, I think we need to change the language of how we recover from COVID. I don't like the way, um, I think it's a UN way of expressing, I know that President Biden says this, that we want to build back better. I don't want to build back that way at all. I want to build forward with equality, justice and sustainability. And if we can kind of um, try and um, use the, 
you know, the fact that COVID has brought out the inequalities and there is some thinking going on in the business community globally. I mean, I'm linked with the B team of business leaders and they are, you know, addressing the problems of the kind of um, rampant capitalism we've seen, which promotes this great inequality. And they say it's because it served only shareholders that, um, you know, it must serve stakeholders, which includes um, workers and their communities as part of being stakeholders. Now, it may not go far enough for some people, but it's a, it's a kind of thinking. And also, you know, equality of pay and also fair, um, uh, you know, fair pay for work done. Um, and even, you know, thinking in terms of um, perhaps, you know, having um, income for everybody. I mean, there's a lot of thinking about that possibility, but it's very, it's very costly at the moment. You know, there's a lot of thinking going on and that's because um, we've seen the inequalities that have been exacerbated. We've seen that people have become multi-billionaires at this stage during COVID and people have lost their homes, lost their jobs, have been in abusive households. You know, that contrast, uh, people can't really uh, be, be at peace with it, if I could put it that way. And I'm hoping that, you know, COVID will have given us some of the lessons that I mentioned earlier in, in going forward. And I, I, I'm, I'm now aware that I, 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 I'm actually late for a call. I have to, I, I'm told I have to take the call now, but Dorothy, it's been great to meet you on, on Zoom. And uh, it's been uh, lovely to participate in this webinar. Good luck to the center and um, I, better, I better run. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> And um, yeah, I would uh, just maybe take on one final question uh, for you, Dorothy, and um, then uh, ask you for, for your closing remarks. So uh, there is another uh, question here of what do you believe is the biggest challenge for applying an intersectional feminist approach with the surge of climate refugees? Dorothy, are the you? Biggest, ah, yeah, you can. Sorry, I yeah. think the connection was there. The biggest but, uh, challenge. The biggest challenge would be uh, the the way we are given the chance to participate. So, um, the feminist and other vulnerable groups sometimes are not exactly where the 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 discussions are taking place. There is a challenge of, of of people from the global south accessing um, Western countries. We have been getting uh, some uh, some some invitations from COP, but you find yourself that you, you find that some activists who are representing the voices of other vulnerable or feminist groups that they cannot attend. Sometimes they don't get accreditation and when they get accreditation, they don't have the funds to go. And sometimes when they get the funds to go, they don't get visas because uh, uh, countries in the global North think that everyone who goes to, to, to their country want to remain there. So it will be very difficult for us to discuss when uh, not everything is discussed in Africa and for us, we cannot access those countries. It is very, very difficult. That's a, a very big challenge. And um, with the climate, with the climate refugees, it is really, really difficult. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and I would close the Q&A here. I apologize hugely to everyone who still has a question, um, but I really want to um, end on time and uh, give you, Dorothy, enough time for your closing uh, remarks. Um, any, any final thoughts you want to share with us? And I would also uh, like to ask you a final question from uh, my side, which would be, what is your vision uh, in terms of an intersectional climate justice um, and 
and using feminist foreign policy as a tool uh, for for the next uh, for the next years. Thank you. Ah, <laughs> for the next final year, my vision is to see more women and other vulnerable groups put at the forefront of decision making in regards to climate justice. Not only an increase of uh, numbers of members of women attending COPs and other conferences, but those women making an impact and also to see the feminist feminist um, policy being sunk, like the way sustainable development goals are sunk. I want you to see it everywhere in the five years. Thank you. And um, I know that we at CFP are, are working on that that happens <laughs> um, alongside, of course, our, our partners from uh, the Monkey Moon Center and uh, yeah, just trying to be and stay uh, engaged and focused in this topic. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I would now hand over to Christina for uh, closing up and uh, sharing uh, some final points with us. Thank you. Thank you, Sheena. Thank you, Dorothy. Thank you, Mary, whoever she's talking to now and wherever she is. Um, it's been excellent. Um, thank you for sharing all your insights. Dorothy, you are a like general role model because you've shown on the ground um, how you actually turn ideas into action and you've had so much impact already. So that is really inspiring and like the things that you have achieved and, and also Mary Robinson and so many other incredible feminists in international politics. That is pretty much the reason why we exist. And this is kind of the work that we are standing on and that we are trying to also contribute to a little bit. So we are very, very grateful. Thank you for being here and, um, and giving your time um, um, for us and the audience. Um, Thank you everyone in the audience for coming. Thank you so much to the Banking Moon Center. Um, I have two quick announcements before I let you go. The first one would be, we have a membership program. So if you love this, if you love Sheena, <laughs> if you love the center, um, um, consider becoming a member. This is like the best way for you to stay in touch with us. Um, I just shared the link in the chat. Um, and final announcement, we'll have our next webinar, our fourth webinar happening um, on the 29th of June. Um, it will be hosted that time by the Banking Moon Center and it will be on connecting the SDGs to climate action. Um, and yeah, and that's pretty much it now. Um, I'm grateful to everyone here. Thank you for making this happen and see you all hopefully soon again and become a member. Bye-bye. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here.